The Hangout is now live on the air. Green dots, excellent. There we go. So, we were just talking about how do you get around your code. Um, so the most basic tool you can probably have is a text editor. Um, like I said, there's a, a lot of them. Uh, there aren't too many bad choices. Um, I kind of broken it down into three categories. Uh, the first one is text editors. Uh, those have big quotations around them. Um, the reason I put that in quotes is uh, these are the, the very basic text editors, the kind that aren't super flexible. There's not a lot you can do to customize them. But at the end of the day, they'll get the job done. Um, who here has used Notepad to edit code? Yes, it's probably like the first thing uh, anybody uses uh, if you come up on Windows, which most people used to do. I think that's kind of going away, which is kind of a weird concept. Um, it's you know the single most basic thing. It's a white screen. It's black text. I think you can make the text bigger and smaller, but that's about it. Um, it's not going to do any kind of syntax highlighting. It's not going to check any code for you. Um, but worst comes to worst, it's there. You can do a little bit of work in it. Uh, another very similar is a text edit on the Mac. Uh, comes with every Mac in the last 14 years, I guess. Um, same thing, uh, white background, black text. You can do some fancier things, uh, but you probably shouldn't. Um, Nano, uh, if you've ever uh, had to shell into a server for school, uh, you probably had to deal with Nano at some point. Um, it depends on your server, but maybe it's white screen, white text on a black screen, maybe it's white text on a green screen, all kinds of variations. Again, very simple. Um, you go in there, you make some edits, you get out as fast as you can. Oh, that's coming up. So now uh, we get into text editors, no quotes. Um, so these are actual real deal text editors. Um, again, lots of different options. Um, one of them, Notepad++. Uh, as far as I remember, this started out as an add-on to the original Notepad, um, although now it's its own standalone app. It's actually super great. Um, if you're on a, on a Windows machine, this is what you should be using. Um, there are a few other choices that are as good. There's one, but few others that are as good. Um, on a Mac or Linux, maybe you want to use Vim. You want to go old school. It's kind of like Nano in that you're going to be working inside of a terminal window, which isn't the most you know, comfortable place in the world, but a lot of people like it. There are so many things you can change in Vim, it will just literally blow your mind. Um, if you have a weekend to kill, that's a good way to kill it. Uh, Dreamweaver. Uh, listen, hear me out. I'm not talking about the graphical side of Dreamweaver. That is a train wreck. But the text editor is actually pretty good. Um, you can do some real work in there. Uh, again, if you're in the kind of situation where maybe your company has bought an Adobe license, but they refuse to pay for anything else, and you can't install your own software, this is probably a pretty great choice. Just stay away from the graphical stuff. Um, BB Edit, uh, this is actually a, a local product. It's uh, just north of Boston where the company is based. Uh, it's been around forever. Uh, it's Mac only, um, but it just it does everything. Uh, people write encyclopedias in BB Edit, as well as really great code. Uh, Sublime Text. Uh, this is my current favorite. Um, it is tremendously flexible. It's available on anything. Um, if you're on Windows and you can install software, you should probably check this out. Uh, and then, kind of new on the scene is Atom. Uh, Atom comes from uh, the fine folks at GitHub. It surprisingly looks a lot like Sublime Text, um, but it's a lot different under the hood. Uh, it's got a lot of the same options. You can, with any of these, um, it's not a matter of the tool that you pick. It's a matter of how you fit that tool to yourself. So, you know, I prefer a dark background because that makes my eyes hurt less. Some people like a white background or a beige background. Find the colors that are going to work for you. Um, if you don't know what syntax highlighting is, you should check out syntax highlighting because it's the greatest. Uh, what that means is when you're looking at code, different types of things are colored different colors. So you can tell the difference between an HTML tag and the text that's inside of that HTML tag. Um, that's the single greatest thing you can do for yourself as a developer if you're dealing with any kind of code. All of these, syntax highlighting all day long. The other guys, not so much. Um, then we get into kind of the big boy situation, uh, IDEs. 
uh, which are integrated development environments. Um, these are text editors that do a lot of stuff for you. Um, they will run your code and look for errors before you even hit the refresh button. Um, they will suggest things. If you're working, you know, I work in Drupal. We tend to work in very long files, um, and a lot of files spread out. It knows, some of these systems know that, oh, you're typing a function that's in this file over here three folders away. Let me complete that for you so you don't have to type the whole thing. Super useful. Um, since they were uh, nice enough to sponsor the event, uh, JetBrains gets the first mention. Uh, PHP Storm, a lot of people super love this. Um, it's available on everything. Eclipse, uh, it's an open source guy that's available on everything. Um, Komodo. And you'll notice a lot of these, uh, other than Eclipse, uh, these are primarily uh, pay situations. Um, PHP Storm, uh, a couple hundred bucks. Komodo, a couple hundred bucks. But if it's the thing you're doing every day, it's worth at least checking out the free trial. Yeah, Eclipse is free and open source. Yeah, Eclipse is free and open source. Um, Eclipse is used in a, in a lot of different ways. Because it's open source, you can customize it. And it's actually what the original uh, Android development environment was built around. Um, it had Eclipse at the core, and then they bolted on all the cool custom stuff just for Android. So you can do some really cool stuff with that. Komodo has a free version. Edit, it's not Nice. I actually haven't used that. I have to check it out. Um, OK, so that's the first lesson is just how do you get around your code. Uh, next lesson is version control. This is literally the second most important thing about dealing with code. It would be the first, but you can't deal with code unless you're dealing with code first. Um, version control is a method of keeping up with your work, keeping it organized, and to an extent keeping it safe, um, both from yourself, um, other developers, and kind of the outside world. Um, I'm not originally a developer. I went to film school, and I worked on a lot of movies. Uh, when you're working on movies, you have to export a lot of files. They're very large files. They take hours and hours to export. And then you tend to give them terrible names um, because there's always one more change to make to a movie. So you'll wind up with something like, oh, final edit, picture lock, version 2, and then you'll put the date, and then you'll put a dash 3, and then you'll say director's final cut, dot mp4. And you'll have 19 of those. And you'll have to read through every single file name to figure out which one is actually the latest one or the correct one, because the director decided, oh, I don't like this one, but that one four ago is the one that I liked. It's a mess. Luckily, uh, when developing, you get to use version control. It lets you take snapshots of your code as you're working. Um, so it's both good for you, and it's good for the people you're working with, because it allows other people to see your progress as you're working on a thing. And it helps you if you run into a problem where, oh, I don't know why this isn't running. It used to work. I did some stuff to it. Now it doesn't work. You can compare the two versions and see what it was that you changed and try to track down that stupid semicolon. It's always a semicolon. So there are options in version control. I have that in quotes. Uh, Subversion, SVN. This is not the oldest, but one of the older uh, methods that are still in use. Um, it's fine. Its biggest problem is it's a what they call a centralized version control system where there is a single master repository somewhere. You know, maybe it's your computer, maybe it's a server somewhere, maybe it's off in the cloud. But you have to make your work agree with what it thinks your work should be, or the whole thing falls apart. And that's great when it's just you, but when it's five developers working on the same thing, stuff gets kind of messy, kind of quick. Um, it's usable. The one that I'm sure most of you have heard of is Git. Um, Git is distributed version control. Uh, what that means is every single ver every single blob of the code is a full master repository. So you've probably heard of GitHub. A lot of people push their code to GitHub. If GitHub was to get hit by a meteor tomorrow, all of their servers all over the world all got hit by individual meteors you would still have your code if it was downloaded onto your machine. Anybody else that has, has a copy of that code also has a full backup of that. And so what that means is you're, you're pretty fine. Um, I had a friend, he was working at a video game company. They were you know, six months deep into a project. They were using SVN. 
and the hard drive died. And it's like, oh, that's fine. We'll go to the backup tapes. The backup tapes stopped working two weeks ago, and the system didn't tell them. That's his own thing. Um, but he spent, I think, close to a month of his life uh, taking all of the copies of the SVN repository off of his coworkers' machines and cobbling together the best approximation of the last product they had working. Again, that's an outlier, but if you're using a distributed system like Git, it's a little less heartache. It's still a heartache, a little less, yes. Another nice trick to compare with Git is to sync Dropbox to your desktop. <laughs> no. your files out of that. <laughs> layers upon layers. <laughs> it's <laughs> turtles all the way down. Um, another guy is uh, Mercurial. Um, this is a little bit newer. Uh, it's also a distributed system like Git. Uh, the people that use Mercurial think it's way better than anything else, but you've probably never heard of it because it's not widely used. I think with version control, because it's kind of a communal issue, the best product is the one that the most people are going to be using. Um, it doesn't do you any good if one person is using SVN, another is using Git, another is using Mercurial, another is using Fossil. Those can't talk to each other necessarily, so you should avoid that. You should just find the thing that the most people are going to be using. And if you're, you're here, you probably use open source software. Most of that is going to nowadays hosted on GitHub. So you may as well get familiar with Git, because um, you're going to be doing a lot of work with that. Um, yeah, Fossil, it's kind of like uh, Mercurial. Um, I couldn't tell you the exact differences, because it gets very technical. Um, and I just use Git. It, it works. Um, but you can always be familiar with other things. Uh, I seem to like to throw proverbs into my talks. Um, this is, I found, to be extremely uh, appropriate for version control. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. And the second best time is right now. Uh, what that means is just because you haven't been using version control doesn't mean you can't start right now. Whatever it is that you've been working on, it's one of the beautiful things about Git. It makes it incredibly easy just to start a repository. You literally you can use uh, there a number of GUI tools, or you can go on the command line, and you say git init and you've initialized a Git repository. You add your files to it, you commit them, you're fine. And now you can start. So every time, you know, maybe do every hour, you make a commit. Uh, it doesn't have to be working code. It's just your working copy of this thing. And so you can keep notes. It's like, oh, I tried to move the menu from a horizontal to a vertical, and then your next commit, that looked terrible, let's do it the other way. Um, it, you know, this isn't like your permanent record in grade school. You can just commit stuff as you need it. Um, another great thing about Git is uh, who here has had to deploy a website over FTP and have the FTP server time out and time out and time out again, and you just, you know, you want to throw something through something or off of something. Um, Git is beautiful because it also makes a really handy makeshift deployment tool. Um, you install Git on the server. A lot of servers have it installed already. Uh, I use one and one I pay them $7 a month. They already have Git on there, so I don't have to worry about it. I go into the folder, and I tell it to pull the repository from wherever I have it. And Git is smart enough to pull those files, only pull the ones it needs, only the ones that have changed. Um, it doesn't have to pull like the movie files and the images and all of that over again if they haven't changed. Um, and it keeps a history. And if something times out, it tries it again, and it tries it again. Um, Git is really smart for a lot of these things. I like to think of it as my robot butler. Um, it knows way too much about me, but it helps me out every day. The next lesson, shortcuts. So as a developer, you probably spend a lot of time typing. I know I do. Uh, the last thing you need to do is type any more than absolutely necessary. Um, also, the last thing you need to do is think about more than absolutely necessary, because you got other stuff to think about. Um, so I'm all about making things easy, aliases. So we're talking about Git. Um, Git has a special file, the git config file. And in this file, you have all the configuration for all the various things in Git. So as I said, uh, so you, you have a repository. You've edited some files. Now you're going to commit them to the repository with a message. This is what you have to type. Now, it's not super hard to memorize this, um, but for one thing, that's a lot of M's. 
and sometimes you put three M's or four M's or two M's. Um, sometimes you forget to put the space. There are errors that are that are possible here that you can take care of by making an alias. Um, so I have aliased commit dash M to the letter C. And I know that when I say git C, this is what I want it to do. And so now I simply type git C, this is my message. And the only thing I have to do is remember not to put an apostrophe inside of my message because that's a whole other thing. Um, this, you know, it's, it's cutting down on the mental overhead required to do menial tasks. Like, this isn't something that I should spend a lot of time thinking about. It's just something that should happen. Um, I don't know if you know Cory Doctorow. He's a, a writer. He writes on Boing Boing, and he does a lot of like really cool sci-fi stuff. Um, he got really into the concept of Git, and he had he commissioned somebody to build him a custom writing software apparatus that did automated Git backups as he was writing. So every hour, it would just take a snapshot of his writing. He didn't have to think about it. He just kept typing, just like he was on a typewriter. But all of his stuff was being committed, and it's great because not only does it keep up with the new stuff, but it keeps up with the changes. Um, and so now his thought was, you know, maybe one day somebody will care enough about me to want my papers in an archive. Well, I don't have papers because everything's on a computer now. And this was his solution to that because now he can hand over that repository to an archive and they can see his work just like they could with Hemingway 50, 60 years ago. It's kind of cool. And again, he doesn't have to think about it. It just happens. You can set up something similar if you really wanted to. I wouldn't recommend that with code because that could get kind of messy, but... Um, another alias. So inside the git config, um, sometimes you commit something and you don't want it committed anymore. This is one of well, there's a couple different ways to do it, but this is one of the things you have to type. Um, I have had to Google this literally every time I needed to use this um, because it's you know kind of specific and there's a soft reset and there's a hard reset and there's a lot of stuff. Um, so I go to my trusty robot butler and I say, okay. Now I just want to say git uncommit. I want to give it a more usable verb that I can more easily remember and not have to worry about the specific stuff. So now I know when I say git uncommit, that's what's going to happen. That's pretty great. Um, yes? How do you expand the verb? It all goes in your git config file, uh, which is a dot file living in your home directory, and git just knows to use it. It's pretty great. It's kind of like, you know, like if you're using uh, like bash aliases on the command line, um, similar thing. Uh, but yeah, Git just takes care of all of that for you. Um, next lesson, frameworks and libraries. Um, some people consider this cheating. Um, some people think that it's, you know, like unnecessary overhead. Um, yes and yes, but that's okay. Uh, again, you shouldn't type more than you have to. Um, there's nothing wrong with using a framework or nothing wrong with using a library as long as you understand what it is that you're using and use it responsibly. Um, they are good for your environment. Um, I use a framework for my command line. So uh, the shell that I use on the command line is called ZSH. Um, and, you know, there are a ton of options. And I didn't want to learn all of them all at once when I switched over to it. So I downloaded Oh My ZS ZSH. And it's this awesome little framework that, you know, I don't know, probably 100 people have contributed to that has lots of really cool pre-built stuff for my shell. Um, I can go in, I can take stuff out, I can add stuff in. I don't have to have it all turned on, but, you know, you can. Uh, but what it does is it helps you get started with that thing. And then I'll run into something that frustrates me, and then I'll go and dig and find out what that thing is, and I'll learn about that one thing, and I'll fix it to my liking, and then I can go back to doing my work. And I don't have to spend all day or all weekend sitting there manually configuring stuff. It's just it's taken care of for me. Um, there are purer ways to do it, uh, but why? I, I, this is something that I just need to do and get on with my life. Uh, so it's command line frameworks. Uh, is bash it for bash, oh my ZSH. Um, they're all great. When you're actually developing, uh, frameworks are fantastic for prototyping. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of Bootstrap. Uh, Bootstrap put up with the, the guys at Twitter. Uh, it's a giant CSS library that has buttons and drop down widgets and pop ups and all the different things that you would need to make a website 
already built for you. Um, now, you probably wouldn't just want to download Bootstrap and make a production website out of it, uh, number one, because it's just going to look like every other Bootstrap website. Uh, and, you know, there's something to that. If you're just putting up something quick, sure, why not? Uh, but if it's an actual product, yeah. if a client came to you and said, I'm going to hand you a check for $10,000, and I want you to hand me a custom website, and you handed them a bootstrap website, <laughs> that's probably not cool. Um, but there's nothing that says that you can't use bootstrap to build that production website. Oh, well, you know, like the, uh, the the sticky header at the top of a website, like, you know, that was so incredibly hard to make before Bootstrap was like, oh, this is exactly how you do it, and it works on everything. And then now everybody has that. And it's not, a, you know, again, that's not a bad thing. It's just a thing. Um, HTML5 Boilerplate is an excellent framework I use a lot when I'm just making kind of like quick, uh, quick and dirty, flat HTML things. It's got a lot of really cool stuff already built into it. Uh, if you've ever gone to a website and the fave icon was like a red star and a black background, that's what they were using. I really should change that. Um, if you're using any kind of library or framework, change the default fave icon, please. That's all I ask of you. Just do that one thing. I don't care about anything else you do. Just change that because uh, that's that's a real it's a real uh, real mark. Um, Drupal is a framework. Um, again, there are a lot of websites out there that look just like Drupal websites, but there are also a lot of websites that don't because they took an existing framework and they fit it to their needs, and <laughs> that's what you're supposed to do. They're also great for production. Um, so, you know, you're prototyping, you want to get something quick. Somebody's like, oh, I have a great idea for a donut delivery service. Let's make a website. You can just, you know, grab Drupal, grab Bootstrap, throw something together, see if it works. That's fantastic. But now you actually want to get out there and get some clients, get some customers. Um, you're using the same, the same software stack, but the thing to do is get rid of what you don't need. You want to, you know, as I say, you want to optimize what you're using. Um, in Drupal, uh, you have a thing called views. Uh, and views is a way of taking a big clump of content and filtering it in some way and redisplaying it in some manner. Um, it's fantastic. It's super great. But it can also be slow. Um, so if you're expecting 100,000 people to want donuts on the first day, you probably don't want to use a default view for something on the front page of your website. That's probably going to hurt you. Um, so what you can do, you can look at that view and actually see the code that it's generating. You can see the database query that it's making. And you can spend a little bit of time and customize that and take something that views made and turn it into a custom module. And now you have kind of a lean, mean donut distributing machine. And that's pretty awesome. <laughs> uh, if you're using something like Bootstrap, one of the biggest complaints people have is that it's, it's large. I, I haven't looked at it recently, but you know, it's a probably a couple hundred K compressed, uh, which is pretty large to load on every, on every uh, page load for a website. Um, but you probably don't need all of that, because you're probably not using all of those buttons. I hope you're not, unless you're like a button-making website. Um, but what you can do is there are uh, tools like uh, UnCSS, uh, which has a ton of different flavors. It will look at your actual website and look at the CSS and delete anything that's not being used. And, you know, you can take Bootstrap down, you know, it's like 99% of itself if you're only using a couple of things. And now you've sped up your own development because you didn't have to worry about building all of those things custom. Um, you made them look nicer, but you didn't have to rebuild the, the wheel. And you got rid of all that other stuff that you didn't need. So that's pretty awesome. What was that? UnCSS? Yeah. Um, and it ties into a bunch of different tools, um, like Grunt and Gulp. Um, it's pretty great. There we go. Uh, so this is the tricky one. Refactoring. Um, I don't know if you know this, but most of what developers do is not making something new from scratch. We get to deal with other people's code, which, well, there are words for that. Um, what that means is sometimes, you know, a client comes to you and they said, we paid this guy $10,000 to make us a donut delivery website. 
And all he did was give us Drupal 7 with Bootstrap, and it looks terrible, and it's super slow. And now they want to pay you $20,000 to make it good. You could start from scratch, but maybe you don't have the time for that. Maybe you know, they've got a big uh, ad going out in a week or two weeks, and you just got to get it done. So you need to look at that old code. Now, the trick to refactoring is um, it already works, and it needs to keep working probably the same. Um, because, you know, they, they, they're invested in this idea of what their website is, or like an internal tool, whatever it is, they're like, we like this, we want it to keep working like this, but we want it to be better somehow. Um, Git is your friend. Um, Git is awesome because, like I said, it doesn't matter when you start it. You can just start it today. Like right now, just sit down at your laptop and say, this is now Git repository. And then you can start making your changes. Um, you can go in and you can customize the, view, the views query. You can make all the CSS changes you need. And along the way, you can make your git commit messages. And what that helps you do is when it breaks, and it's going to break because, you know, you're hacking on it, you can now go back and find out where it broke. And that is super useful. You say, oh, it didn't break because I changed something in the view. It broke because I accidentally put display none on the entire page. Kind of embarrassing, but, you know, those kinds of things happen. And Git can help you see that. Uh, there's a tool called GitLog. Uh, it's built into a lot of the, the GUI, the, the graphical tools as well. It lets you take two sets of code side by side and see the differences visually. Um, it's really rad. It's usually red and green. Um, and it's like, I know that something over here was working. I know something over here is not working. You go line by line by line. You can interleave it in different ways. You can compare it in different ways. Um, but it lets you visually see where something is breaking rather than refresh the page, still broken, make some changes. Refresh the page, still broken, make some changes. Super useful. Um, get diff. Sorry, get log lets you see all the changes you've made. Get diff shows you the, the differences visually. Um, while you're refactoring, functional differences matter. Um, there's a thing called unit testing. Um, unit testing is a manner of testing your code to make sure that 3 plus x still equals 19. You know, it's basically just letting you do very basic, almost mathematical um, comparisons in your code. So that when you change something, you know that what comes out the other end is going to be the same, no matter what an end user puts into the search box. That's super useful. Um, simple test is built into Drupal um, as part of its development process. Every module that is uh, submitted to Drupal goes through simple test to make sure it's not going to break. Um, you can get even lower level, uh, just do straight up PHP unit testing. Um, if you're doing some pretty cool stuff, there's QUnit, uh, which is a JavaScript unit testing. So you know that you know, when somebody clicks that button, the thing's going to open. Um, there is a, a kind of a new thing to Drupal um, that's known as behavioral testing. And what behavioral testing does, uh, using something like Behat, it lets you know that the actual functionality of the website is working um, from the browser's point of view. So this isn't saying that 3 plus x equals 19. It's saying if somebody comes to the website, they are an anonymous user, and they click on admin content delete, nothing is going to get deleted. They're probably not even going to see that delete button if you've done it right. But if somebody is logged in as an administrator, they can delete content all day. So you're making sure that as you're making changes, these actual functional things aren't breaking. But of course, visual differences also matter. Um, if somebody asks you to rebuild um, I don't know, New York Times. They're really picky about how stuff looks on the New York Times. I don't know if you know that. Um, they spend a lot of time and a lot of money making sure that things look exactly the way they want it to, uh, for better or for worse. So if somebody says, we need to move from whatever custom system we're using now to Drupal, but we want everything else to look the same, this is going to be your friend. Um, you can do it the old school way. As you're working, you can just literally take screenshots. And take a screenshot, make some changes, take another screenshot. Does it look the same? Is everything showing up in the same place? 
Are all of the fonts loading correctly? Uh, but why would you do that when there are cool tools out there like Phantom CSS? So Phantom CSS is an, another one of those handy robot butlers that will automatically take screenshots for you. And as you're making changes, as you're committing changes, however you configure it, it will take those screenshots, it will compare them, and if there is a difference, it will show you the difference. It will just give you a little generated image to say, hey, this thing moved three pixels. And, you know, a lot of people aren't going to notice that, even if you're looking at it really closely, but the computer always is, and your client always will. Um, next lesson, community. Uh, you're all here, so, you know, you have a, at least a rough idea of the importance of community. Um, it's often overlooked, particularly if you're working in a, in a corporate environment, um, but it is super important, and it can also be super enjoyable. Uh, what kind of community is there? Uh, there are meetups. So there are, you know, like Drupal and PHP and CSS meetups, kind of like this. Um, there is a, a thing called Refresh. Um, I'm originally from Austin. We had one there. They have one in Boston. Um, they're kind of all over the place. These are meetups for just digital people. Anybody, basically, who works in front of a computer who does something on the internet is welcome to come to Refresh. Uh, and it's just a place to, you know, kind of like hang out with the people who are, you know, of your tribe, as you will. Um, other people that you can say, hey, man, isn't it super cool that you can do this thing in CSS3 and they don't just give you a blank stare? Those are the kind of people you're going to meet out of Refresh. Um, creative Mornings. Uh, this is kind of a new thing. Um, it's a morning breakfast lecture series, uh, once a month all over the world. Um, again, uh, they just started one up in Boston. Uh, I've been to a couple. They're pretty great. Um, lots of Dunkin' Donuts. And it's somebody comes in once a month to tell a story about something that they did or something that happened to them. Um, the last one that I went to, it was a guy whose uh, father died, and he was trying really hard to deal with that. He was a graphic designer, and he realized that what he really needed to do was design a tattoo that symbolized everything that he loved about his dad. And he designed the tattoo, and he got it put on his arm, and it was, you know, that kind of catharsis to let him kind of let go of a lot of that pain. And, you know, super beautiful story, kind of heavy for 8 in the morning over donuts and coffee, um, but it was a great experience, so highly recommend those. You don't have to go anywhere. There are online groups, um, groups like Drupal.org, uh, Dribble. Uh, if you're more visually focused, Dribble is a super great community of graphic designers who uh, show off their work. Um, they are based out of uh, Salem, Mass. Um, they have. They just had a birthday party, uh, and then they also have just kind of in-person meetups all over the country as well. If you ever just want to hang out with other designers, that is a great way to do it. Uh, communicating. This is an incredibly important lesson, particularly for developers. Um, a very smart man once said, uh, the medium is the message. And this is important because we have so many options of how to talk to each other. I don't know if you know that or not. Um, Skype. Skype is super great for talking to somebody when you can see their face. Um, I work remotely. I spend a lot of time with my cat. And it's nice to see other human faces between the hours of 8 and 5. Um, so, you know, something like Skype is great. It's pretty good for, you know, if you just need to do text chats with somebody. Um, but when most people think of Skype, they're thinking, oh, well, they want to see my face. Um, so you have to think about that. You can't just, I don't know, at least I can't, just, like, randomly Skype a friend at, you know, 2 in the afternoon and say, hey, buddy, how's it going? Because, you know, who knows what state of undress they're in um, or if they even just want to be seen that day. So, you know, you have to think about that a little bit. Google Hangout is uh, super great for also for video. Um, if you need to talk to more than one or two people. Um, we use this at work when we're having uh, kind of our daily meetings. It lets you, you know, see the other person. Um, it lets you, a little bit easier than a, like a phone conference to see who's talking and when they're done talking so you don't have that awkward overtalk that happens a lot on phone conferences. Um, IRC is kind of the old standby, uh, Internet Relay Chat. Uh, I think it's been around since the 70s at least. Uh, we also use this at work just as kind of our, our daily um, chat board uh, between everybody. Uh, it's really great because it's just, it's always there. So, you know, you can log in at 1 o'clock in the morning, and there's probably somebody else logged in who can help answer a question for you. Um, 
and IRC is a great uh, way to get out to the outside world. So Drupal, pretty much all of the important decisions that aren't made out of DrupalCon are made over IRC. Um, I'm sure a, a, lots, a lot of that stands for WordPress and for a lot of other open source things because it's kind of the, the lowest common denominator. Literally anybody who has a computer can get on IRC. So it makes a great way to get in touch with as many people as possible. Um, it's kind of tricky though. Like there's, again, it's very fiddly. It's very text oriented. There's a great new uh, service called IRC Cloud uh, that I've been playing around with, and it gives you a really great web interface to IRC. Um, so it makes it a lot friendlier um, and a lot less fiddly. Uh, there's a new thing, HipChat. Um, I think it's, uh, Lassian makes that, um, and it's a like a team focused uh, group chat system. Um, it takes a lot of cues from IRC, but it makes some nice things on top of that. Uh, my friends use it at another company, and they've uh, built custom uh, animated GIFs of all of the employees that they can insert into HipChat when they're having conversations. And, you know, it's not like a super functional thing, but it's a very fun thing. And, you know, like emoji, it can sometimes give a little more uh, meaning to something other than just saying, oh, he's away. It's like, oh, he's like at the store. Like you can like build little things. Um, mostly it's just fun. Slack uh, is kind of the, the newest kit on the block. Um, it again takes a lot of cues from, Slack, uh, from IRC. But the greatest thing about Slack, uh, HipChat does this some, but Slack has made a huge focus on integrating everything into Slack. Um, so we're using this for one client where we set up our GitHub feed to go into uh, Slack. So anytime anybody made a change to the code, everybody knew about it. You didn't have to check your email to say, oh, did you already commit that thing? You already knew that it happened. Um, people are typing in all kinds of stuff. You can control uh, Spotify from inside of your Slack chat room if you want. Um, you can do some really cool stuff with it if you get it super custom. Um, separate from communicating is the art of communication. Um, like I said, I was a film student, spent a lot of time in the College of Communications at UT. Uh, we talked about this so very much. Um, so I guess the first priority is communicating with your clients as a, as a professional developer. Um, and you have to remember, as casual as you might be with your coworkers, you need to be able to communicate with your clients professionally and effectively. Um, you have to remember that humor can be subjective. I'll say that again, humor can be subjective, and spelling counts. If you're dealing with somebody who writes checks to you to pay your bills, you need to be able to spell correctly. Otherwise, they might accidentally forget a zero on the check. Um, you you want to present as professional an appearance as possible so that you are treated professionally, even if you spend all day in your pajamas talking to your cat like it's a person. It's very important. Um, dealing with coworkers. Even in a casual work environment, you have to remember that humor can be subjective and spelling counts. Um, you have to remember everybody has a different background. Everybody has a different way of doing things. Um, it's not necessarily wrong. Uh, it may actually be better than your way. So, you know, maybe keep an open mind. Um, but again, it's, it's just treat you. Know, like they teach you in kindergarten, treat others the way you want to be treated. Um, remember that the things that come out of your mouth have meaning. So if you think, oh, this is a super funny joke, let me tell it. Stop. Say the joke out loud in your head as if you were saying it to people who aren't your best friends and think about what they're going to respond. Very important. Dealing with vendors. Just because you pay somebody money doesn't mean that you get to be a jerk. Especially when you're dealing with vendors you don't actually pay. Um, I don't know if anybody has ever got involved in any, like the open source dramas that go on from time to time. Um, just because somebody is giving you something doesn't mean they owe you anything more. Um, because they put a project up on GitHub doesn't mean they owe you technical support at 3 in the morning. Um, when they ignore a support request, that's okay. Like, you know, you might have to find another avenue to answer your question. That doesn't mean you get to talk smack about them online. You don't get to rip them apart on Twitter or IRC or whatever it is that you want to do. Maybe, just maybe, that person is a person just like you who's very busy 
They spend 9, 10, 12 hours a day in front of a keyboard, and when they're done for the day, they want to be done for the day. Maybe they could use a little bit of help. Maybe you could offer your help, you know, maybe you can't spe fix a specific problem, but maybe you could help triage the support queue. Maybe you can jump in there and say, oh, well, these nine things are all duplicates. And they, oh, that's super great, thanks. You just took nine things off my to-do list. Maybe now I can get to your thing faster. That's a super easy, you know, low-impact thing you can do to help out. Sharing. So much like community, the fact that you're here means that you understand a little bit of, about sharing. Um, lots of ways to share. Have you worked on something cool recently? You give a talk. Um, there are all kinds of you know, local meetups. Um, you can write a blog post about a, a specific problem that you fixed. If you've ever Googled for an answer and couldn't find one, but then fixed the thing after all, blog about that. Because then somebody else who's Googling for that thing or duck, duck going for that thing can find it later. And you've just made somebody else's life that much better. And that's super awesome. Um, even if you can't open source your code, it can be helpful to put it where other people can look at it. Um, who here has used view source to figure out how to do something on a website? It's kind of what we do as web developers. Um, now, you know, some things you can't put out in the public. I understand that. But maybe make sure that you put stuff where at least your coworkers can see it. Um, so if you're working on something, maybe you, you know, we have a, a corporate GitHub account that only we can look at. So, you know, if you're working on something particularly difficult, maybe put that up so other people can look at it. Um, I used to work at the University of Texas, and we had this awesome thing called the Office of Technical, uh, Technology Commercialization, who is a, their entire focus was to look at stuff that UT employees did. This is, you know, state university, state funded. Look at what we did and decide if they could make money off of it somehow. Uh, which, that always kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Um, so don't tell anybody, but I may have put some stuff up on GitHub that, you know, shouldn't have been super public. But it was open source code that I was contributing back to, and it felt super wrong to me to not at least, you know, put it out there so other people could look at it. Um, don't tell the, the state of Texas. They've got guns. Um, so yeah, so talks, blog posts, releasing code if and when you can. Um, code and configuration. Um, so we've been talking about customizing stuff. Uh, when you're customizing stuff, maybe you want to share that customization that you made to your uh, Sublime text. Put it on GitHub. Um, there's a great new trend going on. They're called dot .files uh, repositories. And a dot .file is a Unix term for a configuration file that is usually preceded by a period, so like .git config is a dot .file. Um, so you can take all of those dot .files, make sure you don't have any passwords in there, made that mistake once, and put it on GitHub so other people can look at it. There's a repository of them, .files.github.io, that has a ton of awesome examples. Um, software and hardware. There is a website, a blog called The Setup. It's one of my favorite things. It's uh, usesthis.com. It's linked from there, so you can find it on the, the slides. And it is, I think it's about once a week, they send out a, uh, a survey to somebody cool, and they ask them, hey, what is it that you do, and what is it that you use to do that thing? And they send it to developers, designers, carpenters, you know, various artists, all these people that use stuff to do stuff, and they find out what it is they use. So what type of computer do you use? What type of hammers do you use? What kind of paintbrushes do you use? What kind of software and configurations do you use? And then at the end, they ask them, if you could have anything in the world, what would it be? And so sometimes they'll say, oh, well, I'm super happy with everything I've got. Or they'll say, well, this is a sweet set of Japanese handsaws I've been eyeing. Or they'll come up with, like, oh, if I could have, like, I don't know, three 10-inch, 10-foot monitors and, you know, like a, uh, a psychic keyboard, and, you know, it's, it can be really silly stuff, but it, it's a great way to learn some stuff and uh, sometimes laugh. I'm a big fan of that. Um, now I would like to show you the single most important lesson I've learned as a developer, something they definitely don't teach you in school. The uh, ultimate tool I have is this guy. Believe it or not, a paper notebook. Now, it doesn't have to be a paper notebook. But what, what this is to me is a place to think about stuff and write down what I've learned, either large things or just as I'm working. 
and know that it's here and know that it's safe and it's separate from my work. So I don't, you know, it's one thing to sit in front of your text editor and work and work and work and then make a note in your text editor. Maybe you'll see that, maybe you'll just kind of gloss over it. But with this guy, it always sits right to the right of my computer and I look over it. I'm like, okay, what? Oh, I was doing that? Uh, wait, what was that one thing? It's all there. Um, I should use it more. Everybody should. Uh, it doesn't have to be a paper notebook. It just, I think it needs to be something separate from your actual work environment so that you can kind of shift those gears and, you know, focus somewhere different than those 18 inches between you and your screen um, and kind of, you know, shift your brain a little bit and think about a problem. Um, pretty cool. Make it a habit. Uh, like I said, I'm with Ally Interactive. Um, we're always looking for great developers. And that's where the slides are going to be after this. So, questions? All right, I answered every single question at one time. Yes? Yes. I'm sorry? There's a GitHub project that's supposed to back up your job file from your Mac to GitHub. Oh, nice. And I just started looking at it last night. Um, yeah, I mean, typically you would be the one to move the files and make the sim links, uh, unless it has like an installation script that goes along with it. Uh, but yeah, most of them it's just you, you kind of move it around. And what I like to do, there are some like installation type scripts you can use. I prefer to do it manually, um, just because I don't need everything everywhere. So my you know my work laptop is set up slightly different than my home computer. And when I log into remote servers, I want to pull down certain things, but not other things. Um, so I go in and make all my assemblies manually for that. Uh, but I do, so for things like uh, Sublime Text, I actually keep all of its configuration files inside of a uh, Dropbox, and then simlink like, those into the proper place so that my Sublime Text works the same wherever I am, because that is something that I want to always be the same. Cool. All right, thank you very much.